The pandemic got us into a reflective space and made us look inward to see what we can do for the world at large. As a self-expression coach, I became a catalyst for women and started Vani, a one-on-one coaching program for women on finding their voice, to speak up, to be visible. As a storyteller, I spotted that there were many ordinary people amongst us leading extraordinary lives, making a difference to the world, and they needed to be heard. Thus was born You and I with Rashmi Shetty, where amazing personal journeys with their uniqueness and individuality are showcased. A reaffirmation of the fact, open your eyes wider, the world is far more beautiful when we acknowledge the presence of both you and I. It's our 100th episode and our guest today is Bhavna Thur, the founder and CEO of Shenomics, a leadership platform supporting aspiring leaders to live and lead with authenticity, mindfulness and impact. Under Bhavna's leadership, Shenomics has positively impacted over 100,000 women across all walks of life to date. As an internationally trained mindfulness and women's leadership coach, Bhavna has spoken on various platforms including TEDx and has trained and coached high potential leaders at leading Fortune 500 companies from around the world. Bhavna's prior experience includes mentoring leaders and entrepreneurs as the CEO and director of the National Social Entrepreneurship Forum and an entrepreneur in residence at the GSF Global Accelerator. Prior to that, Bhavna had a nine-year celebrated career on Wall Street, most recently as a vice president and client portfolio manager for a portfolio of hedge funds at a top investment firm in New York. Bhavna has lived and worked in over seven countries and has an MBA in social impact from New York University's Stern School of Business. Bhavna is the recipient of multiple awards, including WEF's iconic woman creating a better world for all. Listen in as Bhavna shares what is a life defined by service, listening to the voice within, having faith and living a life of abundance. Hi, Bhavna. Such a pleasure seeing you. And I'm so excited about this conversation because this is the 100th episode of You and I with Rashmi Shetty. And to have you on the show, I think is the best thing. Thank you so much, Rashmi. Equally, I am so excited to be here. And I must say, congratulations. This is really quite a journey you've been on. And the fact that you've now made it to 100 episodes is definitely something you want to celebrate and acknowledge yourself for. So huge, huge congratulations for that. Thank you. Thank you. And to celebrate with somebody I admire, I think is the best celebration. So thank you so much for giving your time to be here. Welcome to you and I with Rashmi Shetty. I want to know what little Bhavna was like to the Bhavna Thur that the world knows you today as. What is your journey like, Bhavna? That's such a great question and a question that definitely makes me ponder for sure. And uh, I think Rashmi, when I look back to who I was as a little girl, I think in some ways I was very similar. And in some ways I was also very different. I'll, I'll begin with how I was similar. I think the the little Pavna was also equally a dreamer and a diehard idealist, which I've continued to be to this day. And and I'll give you some context in, into how how really that uh, developed over over my life. So growing up, I grew up in a very simple middle class household, and my parents actually both of them come from a very humble background. Um, you know, my my dad literally came from next to nothing, and he worked really hard, and then eventually joined the Indian Foreign Service. After which, um. 
our lives really took a different turn because we then ended up spending, um, at least for me, the first 20 years of my life were mostly outside of India, moving from one country to another. But one thing that really left a, a huge imprint uh, on my mind uh, during those early formative years when I look back is given the fact that both my parents came from a humble background and both are the oldest in their family. So my, my father is the oldest among eight siblings and my, my mom was the oldest of five. They always felt this huge responsibility to take care of the entire family. And I remember growing up, we would live very, very modestly because my parents were so focused on saving every single penny to, to take care of the family. And I remember one one permanent image I have of my mom in particular is I would come home from school and she would always be sitting with her singer uh, sewing machine, just sewing away clothes. Like she would always be making these clothes. And I would always ask her, you know, what are you doing? And, and why do you keep doing this? And and she's like, I'm making gifts for, for all our relatives. So whenever we would come come back to India, she would she would distribute them. And we didn't have the kind of money to always be buying new clothes. So she thought it'd be more economical to make them by hand. And equally, my dad would work so hard and save everything to fund everyone's education and everyone's weddings and just really taking care of the communities back home. And I remember every time I would come back to to India, and especially when I would go to my dad's village as a little girl, I would be just, you know, playing around, walking around. And I would, I would just, you know, peep into people's uh, homes every now and then. And I would, once they would notice me, I would see how their eyes would light up and they would be like, oh, tu sab ki beti hai. you know, bete ao, ao, andar ao. and, you know, they would take such good care of me. The reason why they would do that is because they held my parents in such high regard because they saw them as these individuals who really took care of everyone. And I think those moments, what, what that did for me is really cement this, this belief that if there is any kind of life worth living, surely it has to be a life that is defined by service. That has to be the the way to live. Um, and and so that 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 thought, uh, that belief, that value took root very deeply within me at a at a young age. Um, at some point, I think I, I steered away from it. So one of the places where we ended up was the US, and actually US is where I ended up spending the most amount of my time. I did my undergrad there, then did spent close to nine years working in finance in New York and um, and then went to business school. And so for a while, um, I, you know, I, I somehow just went with the flow and, and thought, OK, let me take the easy and safe path. Uh, and and it worked for a while. But I think as is the case with any one of us, um, sure, taking the safe and tried and tested path might get you to some place, to some distance, and may even look good on paper. But I think when you deny your authenticity, your authentic desire, somewhere or the other, it comes back to bite you uh, in a big way. And the same is what happened to me eventually. And for me, it happened that moment, that pivotal inflection moment for me was right after I finished business school where just this voice inside of me kept saying, there's got to be more to life. There's got to be more. There's got to be more. How is, how is my life? If, if, how am I impacting people in a positive way with the work that I'm doing? And I didn't have a very clear answer that gave me that peace of mind. And that's when I knew, okay, there's something wrong here. And I have to, I have to course correct. And so that's when I made at the time, a very bold and scary decision to leave that comfortable and financially secure life behind and move to India, a country I hadn't lived in for, I think, yeah. two decades, and, um, and, and started my search to figure out how I should live my life. And and, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about that later on. But I just wanted to share with you th that when you asked me how I was, uh, what the little Pavna was like, I think in that important way, I was, I was very much the same. 
but one more thing I, I would share though on a lighter note I think one way in which I was different and I want to share this because I think it gives all of us hope that we can change in important ways that really help us so growing up as 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 uh, as all Indian parents encourage us my parents would also always tell me work hard and you should be disciplined and discipline was the last quality you would associate with could associate with me when I was growing up. Like, <laughs> really? Yeah. Yes. You I look know. you look so organized and so well planned out that this is a statement that is really surprising to me. Absolutely. I, for example, I would always struggle to wake up in the morning. The number of times I, I missed my school bus and would get yelled at by my mom, even when I started my, uh, my work life, it, it was such a struggle for me to get to work on time. And um, yeah, so it took me a while. I think, I think over the years, as I found clarity around my purpose, I think discipline, also because I was intentionally focused on on building it, it grew more and more and more. And then, of course, now to me, um, I, that's one of the qualities I, I myself will pride myself uh, on. That yes, I I do take great pride in being very disciplined now. But I I, I came a long way with with that one quality, and I just wanted to highlight that because for anyone listening. I think we're all capable of incredible change once we find, I suppose, our true north or once we find clarity around what direction we want to move in. I think all of these changes become so much more effortless once you're more intentional. That That's very beautifully put, Bhavna, that when you're intentional and you have clarity. But you took this huge shift and the risk of leaving something so comfortable and coming back to India where you've never lived in such a long time. And how did you even get clarity when you didn't know where you're going? That's that's a great question, Rashmi. Um, I, I I'll 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 tell you this. The there are a couple of things that helped. One is, and and I say this to everyone. Whenever you feel any kind of discontent inside, and there's a little voice inside you that says, "There's got to be more. There's got to be more." I'm I'm just feeling not. I'm not feeling at peace with my life or my career choices. Trust that voice. Trust that voice. I do feel there is so much wisdom inside us, and we need to trust our intuition. Because, for example, in my case, as I shared, I, I began my life with this really, truly authentic desire to live a life of service. But somewhere that that got buried and and uh, other other um, easy uh, goals, I suppose, took over. Um, but I think you can only deny your authenticity for 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 so long. So first, I think trusting your intuition um, and the that inner guidance system, I think, is very helpful. The second thing I think related to that is also having faith, because in, even in my case, I ha- it was a leap of faith. I moved to India without a clear plan of what I'm going to do, what what direction my life or career is going to take. I just moved with this one thought or idea of. I want to figure out how I can impact, live my life in a way that impacts more people positively. I don't know how that's going to happen, but let's let's go on an adventure. Let's look at this as one big grand experiment. If I fail, I fail. I would I learn something from it. And if it succeeds, oh my God, isn't it? an adventure and a risk worth taking like no other. Um, so I think ha- taking that leap of faith and, and and looking at your life as a series of experiments is the other thing I think that that really helps. And third, I would say is, is um, I remember when I was when I was moving to India, I was having this conversation with my friend and I was, I was sharing with him how I'm feeling very nervous about making this decision. And he's like, you know, don't don't be nervous. 
just trust. Yes, you, you it feels like you're jumping off a cliff, but just trust that now that you've taken that leap, that the universe is going to is going to put out it, it, its hands and it's going to be there to support you and to catch you should anything happen. In other words, his 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 point was that when when you when any one of us decides to decides to live life in a bolder way, I feel like the universe also moves along with us. It moves, it comes along to support us, to guide us. Um, and so I found so much help along the way. And sometimes that help looks like a mentor. Sometimes that help looks like a great book that you that winds up, uh, you know, on your desk at just the right time. Sometimes that help might look like a course that 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 you take. Sometimes it looks it could it could it could take so many different forms. But I I feel like these are all hidden invisible signs from the universe helping you and guiding you along. And I feel like that's there for for all of us so those are some of the things i think that really helped that's really true but when you stepped off the path that was so well laid out for you and where you could have easily gone on to reach the top and you took this huge shift and you came down here to india to make a difference to spread positivity and be of service this is such a lovely combination to have as your intent and uh, was it women oriented women focused that you had in mind as well how did you start because shenomics today is a name to reckon with when it comes to getting women some kind of a difference in their lives i love the way mindfulness is part of it and uh, before we get into shenomics i want to know how mindfulness came into your life because Today, you seem so grounded and all clear, but at that point when there was just this risk and that inner voice that pushed you to get off the path of comfort, I'm sure there must have been a lot of questions within as well. Didn't you question yourself at any point, Bhavna, and say, what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? And how did mindfulness come into the picture into your life at that point? I questioned myself every single day, Rashmi, every single day, every, I would wake up and, and there would be this thought that am I on the right path? Am I, am I doing the right thing? Because yes, I'd embarked on these series of experiments, some worked, some didn't work. And I was still just, just with, with faith, I kept moving from, from one to the other. Um, I think how, what, 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 that i think that uh, that uh, that 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 sense of questioning also that curiosity uh, about okay what shape could my life take all of those questions that i was asking who am i what am i supposed to do with my life how what what are what are the strengths that i do have that i could use to be of service all of those questions i think that we all ask um sent me off on what I like to call a spiritual odyssey when I when I moved to India in the sense that even though I'd always been, I like to believe I've always been a seeker, uh, always seeking answers to these bigger questions in life. Uh, but when when I when I did move to India, I think I, I for the first time really um deeply went into that exploration phase and so for I think close to two two and a half years all I was doing is looking for answers so I was I was reading anything and everything I could find in in uh, books related to philosophy spirituality personal development I was taking all kinds of programs whether it was with art of living or landmark um, I was I was act actively seeking out um, mentors and um, and people I really looked up to to see how they had figured out their life. And eventually, I think in one of those conversations, one person had shared with me that you have to have to do this Vipassana meditation course and, and see if, if, if that helps you find that inner stillness. Um, and, and from that inner stillness you'll find that a lot of clarity will emerge. 
And I saw what impact it had made on him. And that's when I was like, okay, since I'm so open to trying everything, I'm going to try this as well. And so I signed up for Vipassana meditation. Um, in, in And I went to Bodh Gaya to, to do this course. And that was my first, first time I'd ever, ever experienced meditation in my life. I never even, even test experimented with meditation before. And, and yes, initially it was a struggle, uh, but out of um, when I think of those 10 days I think by day seven is when I finally started to feel some stillness and then eight day eight got a little bit better and day nine and then day 10 and by the end of it for me it was such a huge aha moment that you know we spend our whole lives searching for answers outside where you know and and as i was doing as well i was you know look reading books and and then this and exploring all kinds of avenues and yes all of that has value incredible value but none of that compares to creating that stillness within and and really cultivating this ability to just listen to what is within and and to see yourself like you've never seen before you know, we think we are what we see externally. And and I think what mindfulness did for me was for the first time made me aware that no, you are not what you see. You are not any of the labels that you attach to yourself, whether it's mentally, physically, in any way. You are the observer. You are pure awareness who is, who is, uh, who is who is looking who is experiencing all of this who's who's looking at the world and as that center of pure awareness is is how you then get an immense amount of choice and freedom in deciding how you wish to be and how you wish to live your life and 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 all of that and so i think for me that's where my my journey in mindfulness began and it's just been slowly 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 I've just been going down that path and so much has become possible for me as I have anchored myself into that stillness more and more uh, that eventually I realized uh, I want to take this and help others along with with the same insights that have been helpful to me so that's a little bit of about how that began. Wow. And do you remember any moment, Bhavna, which is like really in your uh, mind space and your heart space, the common moment where which connected both your mind and your heart in this journey of mindfulness that made you really happy, calm, and gave you clarity altogether? That's, um, I'm not sure if I can think of a, a, a single moment, but I think it, because it is, it, it, it is more, it, it's just been a journey. Uh, it's been a collection of many, many moments along the way. And um, with, essentially, I, I think that the thing that, that really helped is once, once, once I became more intentional, and that's always my advice to everyone as well, is to cultivate that time and space for yourself, however you may choose to do so, because I understand meditation for a lot of people may be a journey as well. It's not something that, that comes easily to any of us. Mm -hmm. So however you may choose to do so, whether it's your daily uh, journaling practice or maybe it's just a few moments of silence that you set aside for yourself or maybe it's you just um, finding a way to to connect uh, with anything that is all inspiring to you, whether that's nature or whatever it is you believe in um, from a spiritual or religious perspective. I think when we make time and space for that, uh, over time we become more and more attuned to, to tapping in to that wisdom within. Um, so I think for me, yeah, it's 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 been a collection of many, many, many moments. Not uh, I can't think of a single moment where where the two came together. 
Okay, and uh, is sustainability also and repurposing a part of this mindfulness way of living? Yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely. I, I that Rashmi happened. I would say a few years ago when um, I was I, I was looking at how I was how I was living my life, and and sure enough. I was practicing mindfulness in the sense of in the in the formal sense of okay engaging in my daily meditation and yoga practice but then I looked at my the other 23 hours of my day and in particular I was looking at uh you know something as simple but nonetheless important as how I was consuming uh in this particular case clothing I was just looking at my at my closet and I could I would struggle to even like close the closet door because that's how many clothes I had just literally everything was spilling over and uh and I was just like what am I doing what am I doing how is how is this in any shape or form aligned with living mindfully and that's when I was just I was just in in, in you know, in in that deep discontent, just, 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 I just had this moment where I was like, okay, something has to change drastically. And I just decided, okay, that's it. That's it. No more shopping. Uh, because this is just taking up too much space, both physically as well as in my mind as well, you know? Um, so I just decided I'm going to stop, um, consuming uh and uh, go on a complete shopping fast and um yeah now i think it's been three and a half years getting close to four years actually and it's what an incredible journey it's been um just like i, I think with, with just like i think you were sharing how you with your journey with podcasting when we first begin anything we're actually not entirely sure how it's going to pan out, what it's going to look like. But just as you said as well, um, somewhere, uh, you know, things fall into place, especially I think when you approach anything with a positive and a pure intention, um, I think the momentum builds over time. And and then the more, the more progress that you see looking back, the more motivation you've get to keep going and uh and that's what happened with me and uh I think um that space that I opened up not just in my closet but in my mind when I stopped shopping um led to humongous benefits for me because I think that I I I, I in particular I think I connect that with all that time that I would normally spend shop thinking about clothing or shopping I I then intentionally started devoting that time more and more to reading. And I think my journey with reading has, 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 has also experienced that, uh, you know, growth curve um, coinciding with my shopping fast, because I remember when I started the shopping fast at that time, I would, I would, I would read maybe about five or six books a year. The next year I moved to 10 to 12, then it moved to 35, then it moved to 60. And last year, I I I, w- I was able to read seventy five books and and I and I do think the two are connected because I created mind space uh, for that. So I I think um, I forget who who said this, but someone said how you do one thing is how you do everything. So even the smallest of choices that we make, it is important for us to look at those choices consciously because they do have a ripple effect onto how other choices that we make and how we live how we love how we work how we lead all of those they're so deeply connected so I I, I really believe in that yeah yeah and who we eventually become also yes. is a reflection of how we live that's that's really really true and what we think. So when you were talking about this uh, uh, shopping fast, I was thinking of retail therapy. <laughs> that here is a whole bunch of people who say that to let go, maybe you should go shopping and you'll feel good about it. Though I'm not somebody who would advocate that. I don't think so. Uh, 
this is such a contrast of making space both in your head, your mind, and also in your closet and living a more freer life. Yeah. And uh, I think the joy is very visible on your face, Bhavna, for us to see where you are with a shopping fast in the last almost four years. Wow, beautiful. Now we come to what Bhavna is equal to stands for Shinomics. Because uh, that is the first time I got introduced to you. I uh, read about you. And how did Shinomics get conceived and how has the journey been since? Um, so along the time when I, I think in those first few years, when I did move to India, um, so I, definitely, uh, I think one big force was, was that spiritual odyssey that I just shared with you. The second big force that was, that was pushing me forward was to, to find a way in which I could, uh, create a bigger impact with my work in particular, and as I was experimenting with a with a bunch of different things, um, I realized. So one of the things that I that I was doing was um, uh, I was I was associated with this organization through which I was mentoring um, young entrepreneurs. And as part of that, I remember I was doing this whole speaking circuit around the country, giving these motivational talks at leading universities, the IITs and IIMs and, and all of these great institutions. And as I would be, I would be in these in these auditoriums giving these these talks, sure enough, I would I would see majority of the room would be filled with young men and maybe you would see see a 10 percent seats occupied by by women and uh, during these talks you know the men uh, would of course be very enthusiastic uh, you know ask a lot of questions and share a lot of comments and i noticed the women would would always only come up to me not always but more often than not only come up to me after the talk was over they would pull me aside and then share ideas and ask questions and i would be so amazed because these were all brilliant women with brilliant ideas and it just it, it just got me thinking but then why 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 not share your voice and your ideas in a bigger way so that was one thing that that I started thinking more deeply about, and I and and right along around that time, 2013 is when Sheryl Sandberg uh, published her book *Lean In*, and I read that cover to cover in one sitting. And and after reading that book, also I was like, okay, wow, I think the challenges that I myself experienced uh, in in the workforce, um, clearly this is this is a, a systemic. Uh, systemic uh, issue. Uh, there are lots of systemic problems here, and there's still a lot to be done. And so that's when I was like, okay, I think I can do something here. And especially um, given given my 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 journey with mindfulness, I realized, okay, you know, you know, looking around me as a as I see that there are so many women just like me who want to live lives of greater purpose, who know they have something to give back, who know, who have so many talents in, in which, which they can use meaningfully to uplift the lives of others. Um, but at the same time, so many of us are also held back because of this social conditioning where we let so much self-doubt get in the way and we make ourselves smaller instead of really letting our, our true authentic selves shine through. So that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to take my love of mindfulness and my love of taking all these amazing women on this journey with me. I'm going to combine the two and let's create a mindful leadership platform for women to allow women to thrive professionally in whatever way that they would like to thrive and to do so mindfully. And so that's that's really how the Shinomics journey began. And uh, how did the name, because the name is very interesting. It's she, it's economics. <laughs> At least that's how I used to see to remember the name. It was like, wow, this is a very brilliant 
contribution and a combination as well. So how did you conceive the name? Uh, that was honestly, that was uh, after experimenting and brainstorming a, a bunch of different names. And of course, I wanted to come up with something unique and original, but at the same time, something meaningful as well. And because um, I, I wanted it to be clear that it is for women, so that's where she came. And nomics, nomics means laws or principles. So I thought by combining she and nomics, what one thing I could convey are it, it convey with the name is that here are the, the the some guidelines or principles for success or mindful living and leading for women. And so that's that's how the two came together. Okay, yeah. there's something even more beautiful about it. Okay, so when when you thought about it, how did you go about creating it? What was the kind of response? Were women ready to jump on? Where did you go to spread this word? Who did you address at that point of time? How did it all come in together and join to become the platform that it is today? Um, so the way we began and the way I, or rather, let me, you know, get even more specific. I think the way I began is I remember the first thing I did, um, because I also got, uh, first of all, trained as a coach. I know you're a coach as well. And the first thing that I wanted to do is more deeply understand what both, what are women struggling with on one hand? And at the same time, what are they aspiring for? What are they, what do they want? I didn't want to make any assumptions whatsoever. So that first year, so 2014 um, was, was sort of that uh, foundational year for me. That entire year I did, all I did was free coaching. I'm like, I'm just going to any anyone and everyone who's who's willing to uh, bear with me as as a new coach. Um, I just spread the word that I am willing to be a source of support to anyone. And so that entire year, I must have spoken to hundreds of women to really more deeply understand, okay, to help, you know, where are the, where are people, where are they getting stuck? And if you take all those constraints out of their way, what becomes possible for them? What are they envisioning? What what makes them come alive? What excites them? And so by the end of that year, one when I, when I had that clarity, I created our signature program, Women Leading from Within, which is essentially a... Um, our, our signature program, that's a combination of what we call inner work and outer work. And quite simply, what that means is 50% of the time we focus on, on creating space for women to delve within and cultivate that self-awareness to get clear on both what they want, what is important to them, what they value, and equally what is getting in the way. Uh, so all kind of work related to uh, related to mindset, and then fifty percent was focused entirely on outer work or skill set, because once you get that clarity, once you find that confidence, then you want to express yourself more loudly, more visibly in the world. You want to go out there and build a more visible brand for yourself. You want to have a, a bigger voice and share your ideas. Um, you want to build that strong network. You 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 want to be able to influence more and more people. And so it's equally important that we empower ourselves um, or arm ourselves with those set of skills as well. So I think both help self-awareness as well as um, as well as those set of skills. And so with that signature program, I just I just uh, started uh, marketing it to to various organizations. And and fortunately, at the time when I started in 2015, which is still early days, uh, somewhat early days, and I think in the space of women's leadership, because at the time there weren't that many other platforms offering something similar. Fortunately, I think that that worked in in my favor because there were there were definitely um, lots of well-meaning institutions and organizations that wanted to be able to offer something like that. 
uh, to their women. And so little by little, that's that's how it how it began. And it's continued to evolve over time. Okay, because you mentioned we. So when you set out on the journey, you were already a team of people that uh, went around to uh, meet different corporates and organizations, or was it you with a team which was in charge of marketing? How did what? Who was we? I, I think what 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 helped is um, to at the time when when uh, this all began, it was primarily me. Uh, but I think with anything, anything well-intentioned, anything, um, any uh, to expand in with any kind of work, it it does help to partner with like-minded people because you do amplify the impact when you collaborate. So I think initially there were, it was it was a lot about partnering with other people who who have who equally have share this ambition and share this vision. Um, so initially there were there were a lot of partnerships like that uh, with other women focused organizations and um, and 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 in parallel what I was also doing was building the team of of Shinomics, which grew over time. Okay, okay. And uh, I'm sure in the journey, uh, Bhavna, there must have been moments where you paused and you saw how it was going, whether it was going the way you had conceived it to go or had it gone way beyond. Do you remember any particular moment where you felt you needed to pause and any particular moment where you were like super thrilled with the feedback that came that you were in the right direction? I think one one moment for sure that uh, I think that stands out is with with one of our um, uh, one of the organizations that we've partnered with and and done this program for. Um, the program went so well, uh, fortunately, and the feedback was was so wonderful. Um, they then came back and said. Uh, you know, given given the feedback, we'd actually now we would love for you to be able to offer this uh, to our women globally. And would you be would you be willing to do this with our our U.S. counterparts as well as our counterparts in in other um, in other countries and and locations as well? And that was definitely a moment of great great pride um, because just it was just such great validation that. Clearly, there's this there's something something working here, and and that was also a turning point for us in terms of going global because now we work with uh what with women globally, um, but that was a turning point, and and I think that was definitely a moment uh that really stands out. I think another turning point I would say is right about now, you know, like now in this present moment, Rashmi, I think. I'm, I just have this uh, such a strong feeling that we are at an inflection point and it's only going to be bigger and better from here. So my, my team and I uh, did this reflection at the end of last year where I had everyone on the team think about, okay, if you were to come up with one word that you want to define 2023 by, what what word would you would you pick? And people picked words like uh, risk taking and uh, courage and spirituality and gratitude. And when I thought about it, with just without even blinking an eye, for me, I knew my word for this year, and it may continue to be my word for a, for a long, long time, is abundance. For the longest time, Rashmi, I think abundance, while I believed in it, I think I was also somewhere I could also feel like it was still, it still felt theoretical in my mind. I was still struggling with it on some level. But now, um, and and I think I give a lot of credit to to of course the the kind of mentors I've had. I, I fully and firmly believe. I think for any one of us, when you when you adopt that mindset of abundance, where you stop thinking like, "Am I enough? 
uh, do I have enough, whether it's time, money or resources, or you're looking at the opportunity, um, can I do this, where you stop operating from that scarcity mindset and you firmly believe that there is enough in the universe for everyone. And especially if you're coming from, from that place of pure intention, for sure, uh, the sky is the limit. I am, I am definitely in that, in that space of, of both reflection and gratitude as we speak, where I am looking back and looking at how far we've come and looking ahead with immense, immense optimism for, for what we could do. Beautiful and such a lovely moment for us to take a pause now where the whole world forced itself to look back in the last two, two and a half years. The pandemic made us get into that pause mode. Many of us reflected and we realized all we needed to do was switch off the button of the treadmill and get off. That's all. We were just in the same place running and thinking we were doing a lot. So a lot of us learned of important lessons, but the perils of forgetting them, yes, slowly coming back. But for you, Bhavna, what did the pandemic do? What mm. were your reflections from the pandemic? Mm, I'm so glad you you were asking about the pandemic because I do think it was a it was a another inflection point uh, for me personally, and 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 yes, I think that is when when it it, it was a bittersweet time. Um, it was it was hard to see the kind of um, the kind of suffering that a lot of a lot of people endured because of the pandemic and even in my family there there were definitely um there was definitely a fallout uh as a result of the pandemic but i think for me personally now when i look back um the first lesson is that the most precious thing really is what it did for me is change my relationship to time you know, um, one thing I know is like, so we have this expression, time is money. I think it's the most misleading expression <laughs> and people should essentially stop saying time is money because you can earn back money. You cannot earn back time. Time is way more precious, way more precious than money. And I think when during the pandemic, all of us were made aware of, yes, how limited uh, time could be either for us or our loved ones, it just changed uh, that, you know, that relationship really, really changed for me. Um, so now I, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm so much more intentional about how I spend every single day of my life. Um, 2020, I think, you know, before 2020, I, I would still, I think I was also because I was, I, I was still sort of finding my rhythm, but beginning with 2020, I was like, well, if, you know, if my time is limited, I, I just, such a huge value on my time. I cannot, I cannot waste any single moment. And, and so I just became so intentional. And one of the sort of the practical ways in which I became intentional was, uh, I talk a lot about habits, conscious habits. And I think 2020 is the first time when I just sat down and thought about, okay, if every single day, if I want every single day of my life to be a masterpiece, what should it look like? What are at the, at the simplest, most fundamental level, what are the 10 things I need to do every day for me to end the day with that peace of mind that, okay, today I did my best. And so beginning with that year is when I really started started um, creating these, these conscious habits, conscious pauses, conscious routines 
conscious rituals in my day and I've continued continued uh, with that to this day um, and they serve they've served me uh, to a great extent and something I always recommend to others as well especially because when there's so much uncertainty around us as the pandemic had created in particular or even in other ways um, you know we always have it always helps to come back to okay what is within my control what can I make certain for myself and what I can make certain for myself is how I show up every single day. Am I showing up to live uh, to 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 live uh, in the best way possible? In a way that makes me feel proud. In a way that aligns with my values. In a way, yeah, that gives me that that sense of meaning. So I think that was one of the the biggest lessons uh, lessons for me and uh, a huge blessing in disguise uh, as well. And I think the the, the second thing also, um, you know, beautiful thing is it just affirmed my, I think strengthened or affirmed my, my faith in the goodness of humanity, uh, humankind. I mean, the way we all came together at that time to help each other was so beautiful. Like, I remember when, when my son got COVID, he, he was five years old at the time, he's seven now. Uh, the way all our neighbors came, uh, the kind of support they showed, and people sending uh, sending us food and snacks and 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 just just calling us every day asking about his health it was just so touching and so heartwarming so um yeah I I think I just that was a, a beautiful thing to witness as well yeah yeah as much as we saw sorrow there were so many uh beautiful lessons for life that we have learned from it those of us who have survived and come out of it definitely carry and look at life a lot different than we did before. Yeah. So at that point, your three life lessons, Bhavna, uh, that you'd like to leave us with. My three life lessons. Um, so, okay, so I, I, I'll be uh, reiterating some of these. Sure. Uh, the first, I would definitely say, is um to live from a from a from a space of abundance i as i as i was sharing earlier i do think um the more and more we live from a place of abundance it takes care of so much so much because so many of us are walking around feeling like we're not enough we're not doing enough um and when you just start believing in the enoughness of everything, starting with your own enoughness, so much more becomes possible for, for, for all of us. So that's definitely lesson number one. I think lesson number two also from my life is please, please, please cultivate that time and space to develop your self-awareness. Um, everything beautiful uh, that has happened in the last 10 years of my life is because I started making more time and space to understand myself to and to also to love myself. Um, so self-awareness would be the second one. And the third one, which I suppose is related to the first two, is um, a little kindness goes a long way. A little bit of kindness goes a long way, whether that's kindness towards ourselves. So I'm a big, big believer in self-compassion. And I've seen the more and more when, when we're kinder to ourselves, we then actually do more, not less. We take more risks. We believe in ourselves more. We put ourselves out there more. Um so self-compassion uh, becomes such a strong foundation for our for our growth and our evolution in our life and in our career. Kindness towards others, of course, is the bedrock of all our relationships and also kindness towards the world. When you adopt that attitude of kindness, then you start developing the sensibility of and start asking, well, 
am I living in a way that is kind to this planet? Am I consuming, whether it's clothes, food, whatever, in a way that um, that helps all of us collectively? And, uh, and then that helps you make the kind of conscious choices that help both help you live better and help everybody else as well. So I would say, yes, abundance, self-awareness and kindness. Wow. Three beautiful words that I think truly define who you are. But what comes to my mind is a quote that uh, one of my friends had shared with me. Coincidences, synchronicities and serendipities are all signs from the universe that you are on your true path. And I think from everything that you shared, this is again a reaffirmation of this quote for me that the moment you know you're aligned is when everything that you set out to just starts falling on your journey. So thank you so much for this amazing conversation, Bhavna, and making the 100th episode so special. All the very best in all that you're setting out to. And now I love the smile and the positivity with which you said that from now on, we can only grow bigger. So wishing Sheenomics all the very best and just wishing people like you who start out and set out with such beautiful intentions to carry on and be that beacon of light that leads other people around who are looking at life a little sarcastically and skeptically to say that no, abundance does exist. And with kindness as its light, I'm sure abundance will see far more people under the light that is covered. So all the very best, Bhavna, and thank you so much. Honored to have had you on You and I with Rashmi Shet. Thank you so much, Rashmi. It was an absolute pleasure speaking to you. And once again, huge congratulations on the 100th episode. Such an honor that uh, I got to share this moment in your journey. And all the best to you as, as well. I am sure you, this this podcast and everything else that you're doing is is only going to be more and more spectacular as you go from here on forth so all the best to you as well thank you thank you so very much with that we come to the end of this weekly quest of you and i with rashmi shetty do let us know if you know people who make the world beautiful write in to rashmi.thethirdi at gmail.com that is r-a-s-h-m-i dot t-h-e-t-h-i-r-d-e-y-e at gmail.com Come, let's explore this amazing world together, both you and I.